Good afternoon and welcome. to today's OR Today webinar, the use of visible light disinfection to create a cleaner environment. Today, we are joined by Dr. Cliff Yankee, who has over 25 years experience of photonics and healthcare in a range of fields related to defense, telecommunications, radiation oncology, medical imaging, analytic instruments, and surgical lighting. As one of the inventors of Indigo, Indigo Clean, he has led its development and introduction into healthcare facilities across the US. Widely regarded as the industry expert on visible light disinfection, sorry, he has authored numerous articles on it and led numerous studies demonstrating Indigo, Indigo Clean's ability to reduce bacteria and infections in clinical settings. OR Today would like to thank our sponsor, Kennel, founded in 1963. Kennel has built a <coughs> reputation for durable lighting solutions of superior quality and exceptional value. Today, the company creates unique solutions for the healthcare clean room containment, food processing, transportation, education, parking, and correctional lighting markets. So for more information, please visit kennel.com. Today's webinar is eligible for one continuing education hour from the California Board of Registered Nurses, and you can obtain your certificate by completing the post-webinar survey, which will be emailed one hour after the completion of today's webinar. You must complete the survey to receive your 1CE certificate, and you'll be able to download the certificate directly from your computer once the survey is submitted. If you have any questions, you can reach us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. And also just a quick reminder that if you've missed any of our past OR Today webinars, you are still able to view them on our website, ortodaywebinars.live. Also just want to tell you that OR Today is pleased to support Periop Connect, <coughs> which will take place October the 25th and 26th at the Omni New Haven Hotel at Yale, New Haven, Connecticut. If you'd like the opportunity to be a presenter, please see the flyer in the handout section of your dashboard or visit periopconnect.com for more detail. Okay, let's kick off today's webinar by giving away one of our OR Today lunch bags to the attendee that can tell me the answer to the following trivia question. 2024 is a leap year, and today, of course, is the extra day, also known as leap day. So what is a February the 29th baby known as? Answer now using the questions feature on your dashboard, and I'll reveal the answer at the end of the webinar. We'll have a live Q&A at the end of today's presentation, so please submit your questions anytime using the questions feature on your webinar dashboard. As I mentioned earlier, our presenter today is Dr. Cliff Yankee. Uh, Cliff, you may begin whenever you're ready. Sounds very good, thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for taking time out of your very busy day uh, to give me a chance to tell you about my life's work. And of course, we'd love to hear questions along the way. Um, if I type in the chat, I guess I'll have uh, someone raising it to my attention. I was gonna try to show my webcam to show you I'm a real person. Unfortunately, uh, I'm afraid it's gonna blow up the interface here and take too much bandwidth. So I'll just ask you to kindly assume that I'm not an AI chatbot and hopefully uh, you know, you'll enjoy uh, today's discussion. Just a few disclaimers up front, right? This is really a webinar intended for educational purposes. And I'm gonna do my very best not to talk about any individual product, um, you know, that uh, can sound very trite and uh, that's not what I want this to be. I do wanna emphasize that uh, while this subject talks about disinfection, all forms of disinfection are beneficial in some capacity. And I will need to make some very specific examples uh, using specific uh, commercially available product based on my personal experiences. I think that's the best thing to do here where uh, I just tell you about my life's experience with uh, necess necessarily uh, our commercial product. So again, there's me, right? I think you heard most of the introduction uh, up there, right? I'm one of the inventors of Indigo Clean and have you know, a couple of patents on the topic. So some of the preamble slides, I think you see these in just about any talk these days. Uh, you know, obviously, U.S. healthcare is being driven by changes in reimbursement. So, all of our healthcare providers are being required to do more with less, and that makes them high-quality providers of services, right? And there's you know some of the programs that are available, uh, you know, through uh, Medicare reimbursement to drive these changes. Oops, and you know, then hospitals are ranked, right? And some hospitals do better than others. You know, Leapfrog scores people, the government scores people. There's plenty of ways to score healthcare providers. And, you know, this is actually from, I think, almost seven or eight years ago, maybe 10 years ago, but, you know, hospitals get fined for this, right? There's a legitimate, uh, you know, impact to their bottom line. 
And so, of course, they want to do better uh, in related to all things uh, that are healthcare acquired conditions, in this case, specifically healthcare acquired infections. And again, just a quick primer on types of HAIs. Uh, you know, there's different uh, modes, it's all based on the portal of entry surgical sites, catheters, ventilators, and central lines. We'll focus today more on surgical site infections. Uh, and the reason we talk about that is it's the number one um, modality when it comes to kind of total dollars for uh, the cost uh, of infections, right? It's the, you know, kind of the frequency of uh, its occurrence times the cost of these uh, modalities. And, you know, we're living longer, right? We're having more knees and hips done. And anytime these knees and hips uh, have to be replaced, uh, an infection that gets all the way down into the joint implant uh, could cost, you know, $100,000 or more, right? So I'm sure these numbers are probably dated and could be easily uh, skewed more heavily to surgical infections. And so when you think about surgical infections in the operating room, uh, you know, I'll just say this as someone who's done numerous studies in the operating room, as clean as we think these places are, there's contamination everywhere. And unfortunately, when you have a surgical wound open or you have a person on a ventilator in the, uh, uh, the anesthesia machine, excuse me, in the operating room, uh, any contamination that gets in there can get into uh, the, the person and cause an infection. And as we know, contaminants can travel through the air and on surfaces and can be uh, transmitted from surfaces to different surfaces, such as the uh, anesthesia machine, right? Or contamination that's on a table can get mobilized into the air and contaminants in the air can precipitate on the surfaces. So it's really just a, a constant environment that's very dynamic with contamination. Uh, once it's in the room, it can go anywhere. And of course, the importance of contaminated air in the operating room is not to be understated. Numerous articles on this topic, you could you know, go to any uh, journal, and I uh, just Google the topic and you'll find numerous papers that uh, reinforce this, uh, you know, almost common understanding. And these organisms, as we know, can survive in the environment for a range of time. You know, you might think of something like SARS-CoV-2, which was really only capable of surviving in the air for a couple hours, maybe a couple hours on surfaces as well, to something like C. diff, which can survive months to years. Now, of course, in an operating room, uh, you know, neither of these organisms are, are typically responsible for post-operative infection, certainly not SARS-CoV-2. Um, but again, you know, the, the fact that these organisms can survive for an extended period of time allows them to then uh, subsequently get mobilized and transmitted to, uh, to people. So how do we make it better? Well, it's, you know, look, it's just, you know, pretty straightforward, right? There's uh, adding additional people to do additional cleaning. You know, I'm part of this environmental workshop, uh, work services group uh, with LeapFrog. And, you know, the question we've asked is, uh, you know, if we're going to help hospitals get better, what are we going to tell them to do? We're going to tell them to do more cleaning? Of course, everyone knows that they can do more cleaning. You can always do more cleaning. But you also have to be rational around the fact that there's a finite number of people um, and that there's just a finite budget for this type of activity. And so if you try to manage those resources better, you institute policies and procedures and compliance monitoring to improve uh, those, the, the, the use of those resources. But in the end, uh, what some many hospitals are turning to is additional forms of technology to kind of balance what you're doing with your, um, with your staffing. And so some of these uh, you know, products, they're all good. They all try to do uh, something to, to remove contamination from the environment, right? But you can think of them in kind of two buckets. There's episodic products and continuous products. Uh, continuous products are kind of what you think the name sounds like. They operate continuously and they continuously remove contamination uh, from the environment. And then episodic products are just a counter to that, which they come in and do a lot of killing activity. But they do it in a short period of time. And so again, it's just a real balance between there, those two and some of the episodic ones you're familiar with, you probably use UV light in your hospital somewhere, uh, maybe hydrogen peroxide and certainly use chemical cleaners like bleach. So some of the pros and cons for both, and I wanna emphasize there's pros and cons to both, right? You know, episodic, it kills quickly, right? And so if you have to get a room terminally cleaned for the next patient, great application, right? Um, and of course, that's what hospitals do today. And if you have an outbreak of C. diff on a, on a ward, like an ICU ward, you need to get in there and get it killed quickly. So that's when you want highly germicidal products, right? Uh, but those typically take the room out of service because, well, you know, look, it's generally toxic to people. Something that's highly germicidal is typically not safe for people. Um, and anytime you have to apply something, uh, you know, manually, you always run into compliance issues. And that means somebody has to be trained to do it. Someone has to remember to do it. Someone has to do it properly. And in many cases, 
uh, they simply just don't do it because of time limitations, right? And of course, once you kill a lot of organisms, um, you know, the recontamination can occur immediately after usage. So uh, again, these are always a challenge for how you, um, uh, you know, kind of, you know, balance the, the use of this type of um, uh, disinfection. And so by way of comparison, continuous disinfection kills slowly. It's less germicidal, but typically can be used while people are in the room. And it allows those areas to remain operational 24 seven. So you might think of an area like an emergency department where these areas are again operational 24 7 you don't know when people are going to be in they're not scheduled to come in they just come in right and so you need to keep that area operational so how do you really apply something that's highly germicidal uh, without shutting the area down right and something that's continuous again if it's running continuously as i said um, it could be uh, used in a way that eliminates the need for compliance issues so that's again a balance to the type of disinfection that you're probably most familiar with. Oops. So now I'm gonna shift gears and I'm gonna talk more about visible light. I went through some of the, the kind of preamble and background there, right? So visible light disinfection, for those who aren't you know, maybe familiar with the topic, um, is simply that it's visible light used to reduce contamination in the environment. And so if you're familiar with uh, UV light, that's the spectrum on the left there, right? Specifically UVC. And that's 254 nanometers, and that's, again, the products you're probably familiar with. Just above that is UVB and UVA. You put on sunscreen when you go outside uh, so you don't get sunburned to block all of that. And there's visible light, and you know there we are, uh, around 405 nanometers. So now just to kind of shift gears how this can be used, um, again, example of an operating room, this is specifically for Indigo Clean. Um, it's visible light integrated into the flat panel LEDs in the ceiling there. So it's not the boom lights that you're probably you know, used to using in an operating room. It's the flat panel lights and it's just this environmental disinfection system integrated into your normal overhead light. And again, I emphasize it uses safe visible light. And so while you're in the room with the lights on doing a case, you are actually providing real time disinfection. So you get ambient white light and low power disinfection. When people leave the room, whether it's between cases or at the end of the day, the beauty of it being LED lighting is the automated sensors will just turn the light into a higher power disinfection, disinfection only mode, right? And this is just like the sensors in your office that turn the lights on and off when you go in and out. And so of course, when no one's in the room, you don't need white light. So we take advantage of that fact to direct all the electrical energy to the disinfecting uh, LEDs and we get a high power disinfection only uh, environment. This is still safe for people. If the sensors weren't working, you could walk into that room uh, it would look like a disco club, um, but certainly you could walk in there, stand directly underneath the lights, and stare directly up into the lights, and you wouldn't notice any difference. Probably wouldn't be any, uh, unsafe, excuse me. Um, again, both safe for human occupancy. So the idea is this technology is clean, green, and cost effective. It's all the things you expect with LED lighting. High color quality, kills a range of organisms, and um, I was the, one of the members of the team at Mount Sinai that showed it could kill SARS-CoV-2. Um, it's designed to last for 10 years with a five-year warranty. There's no annual bulb replacement and you know some UV products require kind of frequent or perhaps infrequent bulb replacements. That's just a trade-off of that technology. Um, and you know again the, the, the cost of these technologies is such that one surgical site infection more than pays for the cost of it. And so when you think of the technology and operations, you know, it's a one-time capital purchase. It's no impact on operations because it's overhead lighting and operates automatically. So, you know, for 10 years, there's no maintenance or bulbs to change. There's no workflow interruptions, no equipment to move around or manage, but it also doesn't require um, people to operate the technology, which means that you don't have to pay for those people. You don't have to train them and then you don't have to ensure their compliance. It's safe for patients and visitors. And again, the sensors do all the switching for you. And at least uh, you know, one of the patents I hold is how much uh, blue light does it take um, to produce uh, an outcome? And that's uh, what we uh, do when we uh, ensure the technology is applied uh, properly for um, that environment. And again, for new construction and remodel, you can use it virtually anywhere. Obviously this is OR today, so we wanna talk about ORs, but really anywhere in the hospital that you have uh, kind of concern for infection, uh, this can be used. Again, new construction or refurbishment opportunities, anywhere you're putting uh, lights into the room uh, can be used. So shifting gears back to the technology, um, the timeline for the development 
actually started his young lady's PhD thesis at the University of Glasgow, Strathclyde in Glasgow, Scotland in 2002. And they had been investing in the technology and started publishing on it in 2008. And then I met them and I brought the technology to the US in 2013, where we began to commercialize it and we launched it in 2015. So how does the technology work? Well, this is true for, for any visible light disinfection, I guess. Um, you know, here's just as an example is how this compares to an episodic system. So again, what you're looking at there is these large spikes, these peaks, right? And that represents a high degree of germicidal activity, but the fact that it's only applied at discrete moments in time, like after a case or once a day when you do the room, however you think of it, um, that's what this represents uh, mathematically, right? You get a lot of killing activity, but in a short period of time. So by way of comparison, um, continuous disinfection is less germicidal. That's why it's lower down on the vertical axis, but it runs 24 sun. So when you think of you know, reducing contamination in the room on an extended basis, it's really just the area under the curve, right? So it's kind of that shaded area there for the um, continuous product. And then it'd be that area under the peak there, if you will, for the episodic product, right? And visible light's very different than um, UV light. It's a secondary chemical reaction. So within the bacteria is this hydrocarbon chain called a porphyrin molecule, absorbs visible light, fragments into something called reactive oxygen. You may or may not remember what that is, but it's just bleach. So you're creating a bleaching effect within the organism. This um, reaction, this chemical reaction, interrupts a lot of the normal metabolic processes of the cell, such as energy transfer and respiration. You know, by way of comparison, UV light breaks apart the thymine dimers in the DNA directly and induces this damage directly. So the two work very differently, and, and you'll see um, you know, some of the studies, it uh, you know, speaks to a different mode of operation. And of course, because you're creating this uh, environment that's hostile to organisms, they can't lurk, and it reduces the chance of getting into people causing infections. And this is the part I'm, I love to talk about. I'm very proud of this is my life's work here, doing all of this uh, data and getting data, not just Petri dish data, but data in occupied rooms, specifically occupied operating rooms, where we can show reduction in contamination. And then also uh, actually taking it all the way to showing reduction in uh, post-operative infection. So again, when you talk about visible light disinfection, it's really three things. And this is something that's very important to understand. Just like when you talk to folks who make UV light, they always have to talk about, you know, kind of the amount of dose to a surface, right? Well, this is very similar and very parallel in many ways. Um, the first thing you need to do is have the right wavelength of light to couple to the, folk, um, the, uh, the hydrocarbon chain, as I talked about. And I did a lot of work in this. And so when you hear uh, people talk about 405, that's more of like, like a UVC. It's kind of like a broad classification. And just like every UVC manufacturer has a, a kind of unique spectrum that they uh, you know, focus on the use of, we're slightly off of 405. It's a unique characteristic of our product. And it ensures that every photon gives you the maximum disinfecting efficacy. Then the second thing you do is you make sure there's enough uh, light coming out of the fixture and that that light is, uh, I don't want to say focused, but concentrated in an area enough to kill challenging organisms like C. diff, right? So those, that's the basis for a light fixture. And then the last piece of it is, how do you dose a room? Do you need one light? Do you need two lights? Do you need 10 lights? And this is a subject that uh, I also hold a patent on, which is how much dose does it take to produce an outcome, and we're very proud of this work. So when you think about safety, again, I'll talk specifically about um, my work and my technology, which uh, is very simple, right? There's kind of two frames of reference. One is subjective, the other is objective. Um, the subjective one is on the left. This shows indigo clean, how it's compared with uh, overhead sunlight. And the thin blue line is uh, a spectrum from overhead sunlight. And what you're looking at is on the vertical axis, um, irradiance or intensity, if you like, and on the horizontal axis is color. And there you can see um, the, perp, uh, the, the purple hump there is indigo clean in the all uh, indigo mode. So it's kind of like the maximum output, if you will. So just by comparison, you get more 405 from walking out uh, into a bright sunny day and staring up at the sun. Of course, uh, Objective references are most important, and that's on the right there. We're, we're tested against uh, really the um, international safety standards that are out there for this type of technology, and it's considered to be exempt, which means it's no additional health risk. And this um, health risk is based on both acute and human animal injury data. So it's a really good standard, really covers a lot of the uh, potential risk for exposure. This is installed in a, a ton of locations across the U.S. 
uh, in Canada here. Um, so let's jump into the operating room, right? So now again, to focus ourselves down, why is this such a compelling application for the operating room? Well, the first thing is it's medically relevant. So again, surgical site infections, as we talked about earlier, are a you know big concern and a big financial impact to hospitals. So check, right? And then in this case here, operating rooms are generally very well lit a couple of 300 foot candles so you can piggyback on blue light to the white light without making it look funky and in addition the rooms are used you know i'm going to say roughly 12 hours a day so you can be in this all indigo mode for roughly 12 hours a day as well so you get a, a really uh, you know highly effective product in that application and as we know operating rooms are highly occupied it's where hospitals make all their money they need these things to run they can't shut them down to do additional disinfection so this gives you um you know, really the best of both worlds there because they have limited all alternatives to improve the cleanliness of the room throughout the day. And within the operating room, I want to continue to emphasize that this kills pathogens on both the air and hard and soft surfaces. You know, we know within an operating room, there's metal, formica, plastic, vinyl, it could be all sorts of things, stainless steel, all sorts of things. And organisms can survive differently. Uh, on different surfaces, right? And this slide has been shown to kill organisms on all those types of surfaces. And also, and this is important, is it gets into a lot of the hard to reach places. And that's because it's visible light and it scatters. And just like if you look down at your feet you know, and you kind of look maybe a little under your desk or something, you see light. Well, that's because it scatters off the wall, scatters off of you, scatters off of anything to get down there. And then secondly, because it operates continuously, pathogens are, remember, are continuously moving around the room. So they may move into a field of view where, and then move into a shaded spot. Whereas if you're doing something episodically, you kind of have one chance to kill the organism. This gives you the full 24 hour uh, opportunity to kill the organism. As I highlighted earlier, you know, the control is automatic. It's real simple. Again, you, you might start the day when you come in at say 5 a.m. to set up for a case and the room will be in the indigo only mode. You open the door and walk in, the sensors pick up that you're there and flip into the, um, the kind of mixed white mode, which disinfects and illuminates the room. And then throughout the day, you use the room as normal. If people leave, uh, let's say you have a case that cancels at two in the afternoon or something, uh, if no one's there for a few minutes, the lights will time out and go into the indigo only mode, giving it additional disinfection. No one has to be trained to do that. And then finally, at the end of the day, when you come in and do your terminal cleaning or uh, restock or biomed comes in to service something, all of that is handled automatically. You don't have to train anyone to turn the lights into a particular position or do anything. It continues to disinfect at the maximal mode um, throughout the, the, the evening. Okay, so with that, let me talk a little bit about the clinical studies, right? And the first clinical studies were really exciting. This was done, um, again, by the University of Strathclyde uh, in an ICU at the Glasgow Royal Infirmary. And what you're looking at on the left is um, contamination measurements. It's the uh, amount of colony forming units on a Petri dish. And what they did was they put the light fixture in a room, they installed the, the fixture there, left it on for a, a period of two days and then turned it off. So they measured the contamination before they installed the fixture. And when you average that out across the room, what they saw was uh, about 55 colony forming units per plate. Then they turned the lights uh, on, saw a dip and then turned the lights off. Right, and they saw the contamination level rise. That tells you that the application of the light uh, reduces uh, contamination in the room. And in this case, they saw that the contamination was about like 76%, which is pretty substantial for just running an overhead light fixture. Now on the right, what you're looking at is how that contamination was assessed across the room. It's on a variety of surfaces spread throughout the room. And to be sure, if you're directly underneath the light, you get a little more disinfection than you do outside the areas. That's why it's important to uh, you know kind of lay out a room and dose a room. But the number you see on the left there is an average across the room. It's not sort of the best case directly underneath the light. And again, that highlights how the technology can reach all the locations in the room. So I brought the technology here to the US in 2013 or 14. First area we looked at it was in the uh, diagnostic rating area at the Medical College of Wisconsin. And we started here because we knew these areas were gonna be filthy dirty. And you know, it was important uh, to uh, you know, do work here because you're next to procedure rooms and there's certainly sterile procedures going on there. It was also a large area, about 450 square feet, equivalent to a small operating room. And we saw great results out of that. Um, and what we saw was that just by running the lights, you could get a 70% decrease in the amount of contamination in the room. And just running the overhead lights, whatever cleaning you're doing, this 
reduces the contamination an additional 70%. You always want to do whatever normal cleaning you have to, uh, you know, obviously act as a baseline, but also as good practice. So with that, we understood, uh, you know, really how to dose a large room, right? And so once we understood how to load, uh, dose a large room, we took it to a medically relevant area, such as the operating room. And this was the first study we did um, in operating rooms. So it was at the Murray Regional Medical Center, uh, just south of Nashville, Tennessee. We looked at uh, two operating rooms side by side, about 500 square foot each. And so the study we did was a, a lot of um, uh, environmental sampling, right? We did that sampling over a period of 30 days in each room. And we did the sampling for 15 days prior to installation of the lights and 15 days after installation of the lights. But we only installed the lights in one of the two rooms. So we had control in both space and time for this, right? And we used a uh, Baird Parker agar. We looked at sampling on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and we did 50 samples per room per day. So over this study, we had a total of 1,200 Petri dish samples. Uh, it's a large number, and it's how you get the statistics you need to show a statistically uh, meaningful result. And so the study design is really quite simple. Here's the two operating rooms next to each other. And uh, you know, in one case, the room on the right, um, it got the uh, integral clean lights about halfway through the study. And on the right, we never introduced the lights at all. We did multiple samplings throughout the environment, and as indicated by the dots here, uh, really trying to look at the entire room. And so what was fascinating was um, when you plot this out, this is kind of the raw data. If you just look at the total contamination you measure in the room as a function of time, you can see starting on the left and going down to the right at the end of the 30-day period, you can see a large reduction in residual contamination. And what does that tell you? It tells you that no matter how much you think you're cleaning the room, there's still stuff in there. Now, of course, you see that big spike there on that one day. Um, that was really fascinating, right? Because it made you think like, well, what happened here? How could contamination increase? Well, you, when you get into it and find out what happened, what we found out was that somebody in facilities was messing with the air handlers that day in the operating rooms and dumped a bunch of stuff in the rooms. So not surprisingly, here you are uh, with a market increasing contamination for just that day, but the trend is quite obvious, right? You can see a huge reduction in contamination over an extended period of time. And that tells you the benefit of using this technology and how continuous plays a very different role than episodic in reducing uh, contamination. So this is a more graphic representation of the results. Um, on the right, you can see uh, the operating room with Indigo Clean, and the red is before installation of the lights, and green is after installation of the lights. And so we saw this 88% reduction, even though the room was being used 54% more. I think that's, you know, kind of speaks for itself. Now on the left is the room that never got the Indigo Clean lights. And so what was very reassuring was that the room with the lights was showing less contamination than the room without the lights. So that's a good frame of reference. Again, everything's kind of lining up. But what we saw was this dip here where there was a reduction of contamination in the room that never got the lights. Now, to be sure, you always get worried about the effect of, you know, the kind of the Hawthorne effect, whether people are on their best behavior and whether or not they're um, cleaning better or something. That's why you do these studies this way. This difference in difference method is very powerful. But nevertheless, we went back to try to understand what happened. So um, in this case here, uh, I literally, go back a slide, I literally scrubbed into the, um, the, the OR and just sat there for a day and watched how people do it. I sat there on the left, on the corridors, and I just watched how people were using these rooms. And it was fascinating. I saw people moving stuff back and forth between the rooms, starting a case in one room, going to the next. It was really fascinating stuff. Because what I started to think was, now hold it. If you have this situation where people are going back and forth, um, it just made me think of like when I was a kid and I would track mud in the house and my mom told me to wipe my shoe before I come in, right? It's like, are we you know, bringing contamination from one side of the, the room to the other? And again, that was what we really identified was a potential source. So we pulled up the building plans to look at the actual rooms and see if they were on the same branch of the air handlers. Not surprising they were, they were adjacent. So you could easily imagine that contamination in one room could get to the next, or maybe saying it differently, a reduction in contamination in one room would show up as a reduction in contamination in the next room. So to test that hypothesis, what we did was we pulled up another room down the hall. This room was on a different branch of the air handler and never got the lights as well. And they didn't use it as a common room. And 
when we looked at this room, we saw that there was essentially no change in uh, the number of infections. And that's on the next slide here. So we actually measured um, the amount of uh, contamination. We also looked at post-operative infection in these rooms. And we looked at it for a period of one year, from October 2015 to October 2016, which is before the installation of the lights. They had just completed their sharps review, had their bundle in place, they were doing everything. And you could see um, the number of cases and the number of post-operative infections here. And then in the subsequent year, um, we also did the same assessment. And you could see in the middle there, OR2, that eventually got the indigo clean, you could see a marked reduction in the number of infections, right? 11 to three, and that was a statistically significant number. Um, the room that was the control room also showed a reduction, but that was not statistically significant, but it does kind of track some that you would see something because of the reduction in contamination. And then finally, the operating room three, the distant control, showed no change in the number of infections. Again, everything just kind of lined up with our understanding. And so for this, um, we were awarded with a major article in AGIC, right? Again, a major article is a, you know, a real feather in the hand of the, the team that did this study and is available for um, you know, public uh, distribution. Anyone can get a copy of this paper. And if you think about the financial impact of this, again, without going on too far here, just if you were to take this one study and kind of project it forward, you'd have an annual savings of a couple hundred thousand dollars. Um, and it's easy to understand because there's no operational labor or maintenance. It's a one-time capital purchase. You look at the amount of infections you're reducing and the cost of an infection at 21,000 per infection roughly. Uh, again, it's a, a pretty large savings. And of course, if you think of the 10 year lifetime of the technology due to the lifetime of the LEDs, you, you can see it just obviously it's you know, quite large. And this technology also has been shown in use outside the operating room. I just put one up here for your benefit. This is a patient room study we did at Allegheny General in an ICU there. And you can see, um, again, the dip in the center of the graph at the bottom there, showing that when the lights are on, a tremendous reduction in the amount of contamination in the room. We have a ton of clinical data. We actually have a new paper that's going to be um, going into press here shortly, where we actually have um, repeated the operating room study at um, four different locations and uh, we didn't weren't able to assess post-operative infection impacts in some of them but we have shown um, sustained contamination reduction greater than 70 percent in each of the operating rooms um, and so it just shows you again that we you know, can apply this technology in a way that reduces contamination uh, in occupied spaces so that's the clinical study stuff to get you up to speed there. The last stuff is kind of um, just some ongoing research I'm working on. It's very fun and exciting. You know, always new things to, to, to look into. So the first one we had kind of question was, in this is how it got started, was, well, when the lights are in the white plus blue mode and there's a, a patient on the table, can you do anything? And the first thing we had to do was just understand if low doses of uh, visible blue light can actually create an effect. Because you know some folks who I think misunderstand the technology think that uh, you need a large dose of light um, based on some petri dish result, and that's not always the case. Because organisms that are not in petri dishes are far more susceptible um, to to uh, the light, and also um, you know the nature of the way the light works is it can interrupt uh, the organism's functioning processes, so you can observe a, a reduction in the uh, you know existence of the organisms um, long before. Uh, maybe cell death, right? So this is a case where we did very low um, levels of blue light. And here you can see this column in the center. And for the average folks, it just seems like some really small numbers. To give you a frame of reference, this is about 10 to 50 times lower than the uh, dose we use in uh, a setting in the operating room in the white plus blue mode. So a fraction of what is seen there in the operating room. And what we saw was that um, the visible light disinfection is about more than just the raw dose. Because if it was just based on the raw dose, there would be some correlation between the uh, irradiance levels on the left and the average reduction or mean reduction on the right. And so what this emphasizes is that as you continually stress the organism, you limit the organism's ability to repair damage being caused to it by the environment. So now you've limited its damage uh, ability to repair damage, any other effects that happen in the environment can now stress out the organism and kill it. And this, again, is a very different method of operation than uh, we see UV light. And then airborne efficacy, this obviously kind of speed, uh, speaks to that directly. This is, again, from uh, some work that the, uh, my friends across the pond did, uh, showing that uh, just having the air organism in air, uh, the light is actually four times more effective against it. 
And again, this highlights the fact that when the organism is not in a nutritious environment, it can't draw nutrients to repair the oxidative damage you're doing to it. So uh, again, this just shows you that again, if you're thinking about uh, organisms in the environment, it matters um, how you actually do these types of studies. And so finally, the, the last piece on this uh, little narrative here, uh, kind of built up to showing reduction in intraoperative transmission. So again, what we looked at was um, through a really interesting technique, it was whole cell genomic analysis where we could kind of fingerprint the organisms. So this could look at, for example, the USA 100 strain of Staph aureus, and you could measure its transmission around the room. And so what we would do is look at um, actually a room with the lights and a room without the lights. And we would do this assessment um, prior to the patient being brought into the room to kind of establish a baseline. Then you bring the patient in the room, get ready for induction, and we do all the assessment again. And we'd be looking at surfaces in the room, but we'd look at healthcare providers' hands, um, the patient's own skin floria, uh, flora, excuse me, through um, auxilia, uh, their auxilia, their uh, armpits and groin, for example, nasal swab, however you want to think of it. And we'd map that transmission out uh, throughout the room based on organism type. And again, with the lights on, what we saw was this interruption of transmission. And of course, if there's no transmission, then there's no infection. And I think that's the, the real conclusion from this. And this was a, a pilot study we did. We're looking at some larger scale studies as well. And this was published at AORN uh, at the show in 2020. And we've had some people ask us about endospores. And uh, we've seen some people, uh, other manufacturers, uh, take data from uh, a non-sporocyle product of ours and extrapolate it and say that visible light can't kill endospores. And so I just want to kind of put that issue to rest as well. Every UV manufacturer has products that have, um, you know, kind of sporocidal settings, and we're no different. We have a sporocidal product with a sporocidal claim. And so this product here, for example, shows that um, essentially after a day, um, you can get about a 70% reduction in C. diff endospores, making it perfect for the bathroom, for example, patient bathroom. You can also have that same capability in your operating room fixtures. It's really just a question of the amount of light being applied. And that gets back to one of the earlier slides I talked about, which is the right center wavelength, the right concentration of light, the right amount of dose in the room. And again, this is a, a test report from a, a, a third party um, you know, a CGMP laboratory uh, that we can provide to people if they ask. And the last piece I'll end up on the science, which is really fun, kind of obviously the disease of our time, uh, SARS-CoV-2. And so just a quick primer for folks who maybe are familiar or not familiar with the topic, uh, there's really two flavors of virus. There's the uh, non-enveloped virus. Um, so in that you have the uh, infectious material, the RNA, um, surrounded by something called a capsid. It's like a sheath that keeps all the contents of the organism in addition to the RNA in there. Um, and then there's the spikes. The spikes, of course, are how these organisms attach to uh, you know other mammalian cells. And on the left, that's the non-enveloped virus. On the right is an enveloped virus. It's really the same structure except the, for the presence of the fatty lipid layer, which is the envelope. And you know what enveloped viruses are. That's like norovirus on a cruise ship. And of course, enveloped virus is SARS-CoV-2 and influenza A. And so, uh, step back one second here. Um, so in the course, in the summer of 2020, when this pandemic hit, everyone asked me, does this kill um, enveloped viruses? Well, we only had data on non-enveloped viruses. And so of course, the enveloped virus uh, you know, everyone had a question about that, and really the, the effect is that this was ineffective against non-enveloped viruses. There was no hydrocarbon chain within the non-enveloped virus to absorb the visible light, and so data showed, historical data showed, that the light was ineffective against that uh, type of organism. But I believe that with the um, fatty lipid layer surrounding the enveloped virus, it contained hydrocarbon chains which could create the reaction, the oxidative reaction we needed to uh, essentially denature the virus. And so I reached out to Mount Sinai in New York, met uh, Dr. Adolfo Garcia Sastri in his laboratory, and we went out there and we did these measurements, right? And this is just an example of how we did the test setup. You can see on the, in the, the hood here is the light fixture we use on the bottom is the uh, radi uh, spectroradiometer we use to measure the output. And here you can see um, we talk about uh, the, the spectrum of the product. And then over here, when we actually did the um, irradiations, uh, we actually had the organism in phosphate buffered saline. So it's a very neutral medium to preserve the virus. And when you would irradiate it, you would then plate that out and apply a stain to it. And what you would see is um, a reduction in the infectivity of the organism. And we did this by taking the um, whatever virus was left and sprinkling it over uh, mammalian cells. 
And so if the mammalian kidney cell took up the virus and the virus was infectious, you could then see a spot. So the spot is a physical manifestation of the uh, amount of infectivity in the virus, which is very different than how a lot of people measure these, um, these studies. Typically, they're measuring some amount of uh, viral um, content uh, left. We're actually looking at the kind of the clinically observable meaningful result, which is the infectivity of the virus. And you can see here that after just a few hours, it would completely denature the virus. And so this is the data we collected for a variety of irradiance uh, levels so that, again, we can think about how to dose a room. Um, and here on the bottom, you can see that when we measured it against the uh, non-enveloped virus, the electromyocardial virus, we saw no uh, meaningful activity. And that was consistent with historical um, expectations. And so uh, it really told us that what we were observing was real and legitimate, right? So you can see a variety of inactivation curves here for a variety of um, levels of uh, blue light. And we actually looked at um, you know, the uh, effect on influenza A as well. So we looked at all these different types of organisms, and this was the first ever observed result where visible light could kill uh, an enveloped virus. So uh, not only were we, the team, uh, very proud of this, um, it's something for which we were awarded a, a, a publication in Nature. Now, I will say that I have seen some other uh, manufacturers of visible light try to take these results and, uh, you know, essentially misstate uh, their, their clinical impact. And so, I, again, I would just say that when you talk to somebody about this, you, you need to have somebody boil it down, not just with the lab report, but uh, essentially what their product uh, does in an actual uh, environment uh, based on, uh, you know, kind of these results like this. So you can use this in a ton of applications outside of the, um, uh, the environment there. You could put it in the patient bathroom. You could put it in the operating room. Uh, you put it in waiting areas, procedure exam room, isolation rooms, sterile processing or the pharmacy, uh, trauma triage, even dialysis clinics. This is an interesting application because, uh, you know, in dialysis centers, um, people come in with a fistula, for example, for hemodialysis. And that's uh, obviously a very uh, serious portal. Uh, which you can get an infection. And these dialysis centers are uh, quite uh, quite uh, packed, I guess, right? Uh, occupied. And so uh, this virus could kill, um, you know, enveloped viruses. And of course, uh, you know, the viruses that are in there, uh, particularly, um, you know, some of the other ones that are in dialysis centers could uh, get into the person's body. So we could help out in that interesting uh, application as well. Let me take a moment and start to wrap up here. This will be perfect. We'll have time for questions, and everyone might get a few minutes back to uh, go finish their lunch. So why is visible light disinfection uh, an important consideration for use in creating a cleaner and safer environment? Well, it, obviously, it's safer, right? It, we've shown that it can kill organisms, shown that it can reduce post-operative infection, and that you know we, uh, Cal and, and obviously me, know how to apply the technology to ensure that you get a clinically meaningful result. Um, it doesn't use UV, so it doesn't damage surfaces and plastics and fabrics. Um, it's a one-time capital purchase, and that's important, too, because, you know, look, everyone's uh, hospital's budget is tight these days. And, you know, with a 10-year lifetime, uh, no annual maintenance and a five-year warranty, this is the type of technology that you can put in and forget it. It really affects the uh, return on investment for the technology. And as we saw during the pandemic, uh, there's just not a lot of people available to go do these jobs and, and do a lot of the uh, environmental service jobs in hospitals. So anytime you add additional work uh, to their uh, plate, additional staff or training uh, can be required. And that's just another consideration for hospitals to deal with. Right? And, you know, again, we have to be very careful here. We have a study that shows that it reduces SSIs. So we want to be clear that the primary intent of the product is to reduce contamination in the room, that we do have information to show how that uh, can reduce SSIs in, in kind of one application. Um, we've also shown that it can reduce intraoperative transmission in this pilot study as well, shown that it can uh, kill viruses such as SARS-CoV-2, uh, installed at a ton of locations across the U.S., uh, proven payback can be adapted to any lighting form factor uh, outside of that environment. So with that, I will uh, end and uh, take questions as best I can here. Any folks that uh, want to ask, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen for a minute here, just so I can uh, go on from there and start pulling up the uh, questions that folks have. Them. And of course, you can submit them to me afterwards. Uh, there's contact information there. to be able to contact out from there, and then we'll, we'll go from there. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Cliff. Yeah, I got quite a few questions that have come in. Um, 
the first one is um, you mentioned it's safe for room occupants. What proof do you have? Oh, sure. Okay. Let me go back and show the screen here. And if everyone will indulge me, I will uh, go back to the safety study. Apologize, scrolling through screens here. Uh, the, uh, there it is, right here. Very good. Let me go back to this one. So, what I may have not correctly called out was on the right is the proof that it's safe for people. So, these are international safety standards here that define the amount of light that a person can be exposed to for both um, acute and uh, chronic injury. And that is based on actual human and animal injury data. So uh, perhaps the, uh, the the questioner was thinking like, you know, what kind of a study do you have that shows it's safe? These are the studies um, based in these standards. Okay, and bear with me, this is quite a long question. This, okay. uh, <laughs> 405 wavelength might be safe for people in the room, but is it safe for the patient who is open, who is open on the table? For example, oh. 222 NM is deemed safe for humans because it, can, because it cannot go through your dead skin layer. But the patient at, at points right. doesn't always have that protection of a dead skin layer when there's a, a surgical yeah. incision. Is there any concern with patient exposure? Oh, that's a very perceptive question. So let me try to break that down. Let's spend a little time on this because we have this time, fortunately. So um, the safety that we're talking about here is safety for um, injury to the eye. And so that is photoretinitis, photo excuse me, uh, on the eye. And then the if there was an infrared component, it would be through skin erythema, or if it was UVB, it would be a skin erythema. So there's no issue with regards to reddening of the skin because it's not in that particular portion of the spectrum. And you know, certainly for the eye, it's safe. Um, the ambient blue light and how it's exposed to your skin does not induce either of those effects. Um, separately from that, and you know, if you're thinking of a patient on a table with a surgical wound open, could it get in a cavity and do something? Uh, again, the level of disinfection is low. It's operating for a short period of time, but again, the, the safety period of it or the safety concern for it is not uh, just kind of absorption by tissue. It's damage to the eye or skin erythema, which doesn't apply here. I hope I answered the question. If I didn't answer the question, please feel free to follow up, uh, you know, in some capacity, either here or after the, uh, the, the webinar. Okay, great. Um, uh, also, in one slide, in, it identified that when the IC light is on the on, the pathogen volume decreased, but then when they were turned off, the volume went up again. Was this uh, a controlled right. room with no activity or an active room? Great. Let me go back to that one as well. Good, good questions. Folks are paying attention. I love that. So let's take here. This was the um, the one on the left. This was a um, ICU room. You had the light in the ceiling, but the disinfecting light was turned off. So initially, um, the point on the left here is pathogen content measured um, when the light is off. It's always measured uh, as a kind of function of uh, you know what you're you're seeing by putting petri dishes on the surface to uh, lift contamination off the surface, right? Then you turn the light on and you see this dip, and that's this part here. And they ran the period for two days and they sampled, and then they turned the lights off and they saw the contamination rise back up. Oops, go back there. So that shows the effect of. Uh, the light reducing contamination. And again, this was kind of an absolute measurement because they were measuring the amount of contamination, but they did they did clean the room. So whoever came through and cleaned the rooms, uh, this is a, a measurement above and beyond the uh, normal uh, infection control practices as noted at the bottom. Okay, so how... compared to other UV light and chemical vapor? You know, and I lost the first half of the question, the audio cut out, if you could repeat it. I guess it sounds like a question of how this compares to UV or chemical vapor. Effect yeah, how does IC okay. compare to, for product effectiveness, compared to other UV light and chemical vapor? Sure, so um, you know, I think as I may have alluded to earlier, um, you know, UV light is more germicidal, and uh, this is the whole episodic versus continuous. So let me see if I can find that picture here for you. Uh, where is that? 
do 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 it's always trying to find it because the images speak better than i could ever do it but there we go so this is the kind of comparison in a very abstract way so if you look at episodic that could be your your uh, uv or your chemical vapor systems right um they're more germicidal so if you uh, say you know start at eight o'clock and you measure the contamination then you put a bunch of bleach on the surface and then measure it again you know i say at 8 10 then yes you're going to see a tremendous reduction that's the uh, you know the nature of the episodic system it's far more germicidal but then you ask yourself the question well what's the contamination level if i measured at 10 a.m what if you you know start at eight um, apply bleach to a surface and then don't measure till 10. well that's the recontamination effect coming into play and so this is where it's sort of like how do you measure the stop and start endpoints for a technology so you can think of this in two ways. One is to essentially say, look, at the end of the day, all these things have to reduce infections. That's one way to think of it. And so you could look at, you know, is there HAI data? Because at the end of the day, that's the ultimate kind of bottom line equilibrator, right? It's the way everything ultimately would be assessed. But the other thing you could do is you could think of like, well, if you have a, a highly germicidal product that you apply to say a patient room when you do turnover. So think of an ICU room and you bring the patient in and you, uh, clean the room, then you apply the UV and you bring the next patient in. That's great. But while that patient is in the room, and let's say they're in the ICU room for five days, what type of disinfection are they getting? Right? What's the disinfection that they're getting? Because you can't take the patient out of the room and push a UV device through there. You can't spray hydrogen peroxide in there. Uh, they've come through and wiped down, but they're probably not cleaning with bleach or something that's uh, highly caustic while the patient's in there. So this is where you get into episodic and continuous. And so it's really hard to Put them up against each other because one's kind of like the tortoise the other one's the hare right so this is where i kind of just constantly go back to do you show contamination reduction over an extended period of time and that was the study that we did that showed 30 days you know from beginning to finish you saw there was far less contamination because you were picking up the stuff that was being missed and then can you reduce infections and i think that's ultimately the best way to do it and again i want to be clear all those other products hydrogen peroxide UV light, do great things. There's times where you've got to come in and just kind of hit the room right then and there. Could be a C. diff outbreak, could be whatever it is. You know, those are good products and they do good things. Okay, great. Another question here is, how will this affect laparoscopic cases since we usually turn the lights off for the procedure? Uh, another perceptive question. So obviously, if you turn the lights off, you get no disinfection, right? That's just, it kind of goes without it. Um, you, the, typically, when you do the laparoscopic procedure, you're down to just about zero. So during the, the actual procedure time, whenever you're doing it, for that small increment of time, you would have little to no disinfection. Of course, when the case is done, you flip it back up. Um, so if you think of a, let's say it's a room that's used laparoscopically for 12 hours a day, the amount of time that you're probably dialed in with the lights down is probably less than half of that. So roughly call it five or six hours. Uh, and then most importantly, you get the uh, the time at the end of the day when it goes into the all indigo mode. And that's where you get this balancing effect of being able to get additional disinfection in the evening um, to get the room cleaner and get all the stuff that you missed before you start the next day. These are good questions. Folks are really paying attention. There, I really enjoy that. Oh, did you did you lose me? Did you hear me talk? Okay, I'll try one more time. Sorry, I <laughs> apologize. I'll just repeat my answer for completeness. So, in the laparoscopic cases, uh, you dial the um, light down, uh, and during the procedure. So, yes, no light means no disinfection. Um, but of course, the lights are dialed down typically only when you're actually doing the procedure. When you're finished with that, you turn the lights back up. You'll get your disinfection. Um, and then, of course, at the end of the day, when no one's in the room, you get the all indigo mode to get the kind of terminal cleaning effect. So uh, we've done studies in um, these types of rooms as well, where we've seen um, uh, the, the question here. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. I'm just double checking. There's something was uh, my I'm fighting with my technology. Yes, I can you all my Apple gadgets. There you go. Perfect. Sorry, they all try to detect each other simultaneously. I'll try the third time just to make sure we get the the recording. I apologize for the technology trouble here. Um, so in a laparoscopic procedure, you dial the uh, uh, in uh, you know intensity down during the procedure. So with no intensity uh, or no light, you get no disinfection for that brief period of time. 
but that highlights the importance of the continuous nature of the technology. So if you think of that over a 24 hour day, it's a small period of time during which you would not get uh, any disinfection. So you'll get it throughout the rest of the day, the, the time when the, you know, the case is not being uh, actually performed, and of course at the end of the day. And we've done studies in rooms where they have minimally invasive procedures, and we've seen essentially the same level of contamination reduction uh, over uh, an extended period. Perfect. Well, before we wrap up today, Cliff, we've got one more question. Um, would you recommend Lovely. this technology for non-medical applications like, like gyms, schools, daycares, etc.? Oh my goodness, yes. We actually have a, numerous installs uh, outside of the healthcare environment. Uh, we have some we're not at fire departments. We have them in food processing centers. Uh, I will say this is not necessarily a healthcare environment. We have them at the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, we also have them in uh, high school locker rooms, a uh, couple high schools. We've done it in uh, lots of applications. And if folks would like to talk more about that, they can reach out to, to us and we can you know, help them understand those applications. The critical nature of those applications is understanding kind of the level of light in the room so that you don't over illuminate the room and make it so people don't want to be in there. And then also how the room is used, how often is it occupied during the day. And then finally, what type of pathogens are looking to be concerned about, right? If it's, you know, an area where they want to kill, um, say, black mold, we would tell them, no, thank you. Uh, we're just not effective against Aspergillus niger. We, we are very open about that. That's, you know, like every disinfectant does something uh, differently and has organisms that are either effective or ineffective against. And that's how we approach any kind of non-medical application. Okay, great. If you wouldn't mind putting up your um, last slide, so indeed, yep. If you have any uh, attendees, if you've got any further questions for Cliff, if you would like to reach out to him directly, I'm sure he'd be very happy to answer your questions. Great, perfect. And I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on, I'm so on LinkedIn. thank you, Feel free. Cliff, yeah. for your time today and such a great informative presentation. Thank you so much. Um, Perfect, thank you. So as, as okay, promised, the answer to today's trivia question is a leap limb. So congratulations to our winner, Carrie Bay Beatty. Um, also, please visit Kennel's website, kennel.com, to learn more about the products they provide for the industry. Uh, just a quick reminder too, you can obtain your CE certificate by completing the post-webinar survey, which will be emailed one hour after the completion of today's webinar. You must complete the survey to receive your certificate, and you'll be able to download the certificate directly from your computer once you've submitted the survey. If you have any questions, you can reach us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. Please visit... Visit ortodaywebinars.live for more details of all our upcoming webinars and, of course, complimentary registration. Thank you all again for your time today, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.